we've just been spending the whole day um, exploring how translation and multilingualism is a huge asset. It's a powerful means of change. We've been celebrating success, identifying challenges, and thinking about potential alliances, and getting tips from each other's experience. We've heard from a fantastic range of really inspiring projects by artists and organisations working on the ground in a whole range of settings, educational and community. Um, we've learnt the phrase transformative pedagogy. <laughs> we've uh, heard about how to harvest oral stories. Absolutely, the need to support teachers as much as students and young people. And also how those young people who speak several languages, and I quote here, can go and feel comfortable in the world because I speak several languages. And how one project is seen, and that's Translation Nation, as a country of words that anyone can travel to. And we really have travelled an incredible range of, of, of projects and ideas. I should say from, and I don't want to sound too glib here, but actually it's very striking, from profiteroles <laughs> to the profit. <laughs> some of those you know, conversations we had at the end of the last session about some of those freedom of expression issues, surveillance, you know, very, very serious. And, and, and actually what today's world is doing, in, impacting on, on our multilingualism, on our multiculturalism. Um, but above all, I would say we've covered much ground, you know, sharing stories, and, and stories is at the heart of it, stories that can inspire us. Um, and so it's my great pleasure to, to welcome... Um, our next speaker, who is a, a great storyteller, Michael Rosen. I think Michael hardly needs any introduction. He's renowned as a poet, performer, writer, and broadcaster. He lectures and teaches in universities on children's literature, reading, and writing. Uh, he's currently presenting, and I'm sure many of you have heard it, Word of Mouth, the magazine program that looks at the world of words and the way we use them. And in one of the episodes, um, he talked about his work on Translation Nation and described the intense work of the children, working words, pushing words to mean things, rejecting them when they don't work and finding others, and how excited and empowered they were by translation and their multilingual skills. So perhaps, Michael, if you don't mind, I could also describe you as a multilingual activist. So come on up, <laughs> Michael. Thank Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, to hoop means to slurp your soup, yes? To fetch means to generally moan, but it can also mean to puke, but we'll just keep with the moaning bit. Uh, to greps means to burp, and to fots means to fart. A bagel is a bagel, okay? And my mother thought that if you had wrinkles in your socks, that's because you had bagels in your socks. So I wrote, and I hope you'll be able to join in with it in just a moment, don't hoop, don't kvetch, don't greps, don't fots, take the bagels out of your socks. We'll try one more time together. So, so we'll just take the words hoop, okay, so nice little ch in the back there. Hoop, okay, kvetch, that's quite easy. Greps, fots, and bagels, of course. Here we go. So one, two, three, don't hoop, don't kvetch, don't greps, don't fots, take the bagels out of your socks. Lovely, very good, well done, thank you. My right, little bilingual poem there. Um, so just, to, just to start off with a little bit of kind of home background, um, I wasn't technically speaking brought up in a bilingual house, and I was just thinking about this listening to you. A lot of people, in fact, um, grow up in a house where we have bits, rather than bilingualism or even multilingualism. Uh, both my parents were bilingual. I only found this out when we went to Germany in 1957, uh, believe it or not, it was East Germany. I can explain later. Um, and we were in East Germany, and we sat down, and my mother said, I can understand everything they're saying. And we turned to her and said, why is that, Mum? And she said, well, because it sounds like they're talking in Yiddish. And we said, well, it's actually German, Mum. And that was one of that Mum's jokes, that this kind of thing that she would do. Um, and I'd never realised that she, she, she then explained she had, in actual fact, been brought up in a purely Yiddish-speaking house. And with none of us, I was 11 at the time, and I didn't really know. I, we always thought that it was my dad who knew Yiddish because he swore in Yiddish. So long imprecations, which my mother would then say, don't say that. We'd say, what did he say? And she would say, don't tell them. 
So I had to wait for my dear mum to die um, and then immediately took notes on what it was that my dad um, had been saying all those years. But anyway, there was lots of Yiddish in the, in the ha home, but it, we weren't, technically speaking, um, uh, bilingual. But also my parents both spoke French very well and quite often we went to France almost every year. And so, in a sense, the house would be full of French and French songs. And my dad had been in Germany for a couple of years um, and so also spoke German. And so I have a sense that at home... There was lots of language. My dad also went off to learn Russian because of vague, strange political sympathies, part of the East German thing. Um, you begin to get the picture, aren't you? Um, and, uh, and also would quote Latin for some reason, and then um, even Anglo-Saxon. So um, I, that's obviously quite a sort of academic way, but there was also this vernacular language, Yiddish. It just reminds me when I go to schools, and I quite often share with them some of these Yiddish words, partly because they find them, they sound funny, words like schmindrik and schmutter and so on. And so I teach these words. And um, it's quite interesting. I get the impression, obviously, that many people live, not strictly speaking bilingually, but sort of bitsily. Um, that's the technical <laughs> word for it, um, as, as I did. So maybe we'll return to that, because though it may be bits, they're very valuable bits, and they're bits that count and matter to us. As I often explain to children, I didn't know the English word for a drying up cloth. Okay? As far as I knew, it was the schmutter. That's what it was, and when I used to go to school and I'd say, you know when you're drying up with the schmutter, and my friends would go, you what? <laughs> and I'd say, with the schmutter, and they go, what's the schmutter? And I'd say, what's the thing you dry up with? They'd say, no, 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 it's a drying up cloth. And I'd say, no, 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 it's a schmutter. And they went, no, no, it's a drying up cloth. And I go home and I say to my mum, and I'd say, mum, the boys and girls at school, they say it's a drying up cloth. And mum said, well, they're wrong, it's a schmutter. <laughs> So it matters that it's a schmutter. So there you go. So, um, but more seriously, if you like, just as you've been exploring, and I really want to be quite careful about um, saying what you've already been saying, what you already know. I mean, the room is jam-packed full of so many forms and different kinds of expertise, as I heard in the previous, the previous session. I don't want to, you know, keep repeating what you were saying. I'm kind of firm it all. The only thing I would say is don't forget the history and geography of this. I mean, you may well have explored this. That's to say... Um, from many years ago, I can name two people, for example, say at the Institute of Education, um, exploring bilingualism and multilingualism. The name Josie Levine might mean something to you, who wrote often, and somebody called Harold Rosen, uh, who coincides with being my father, um, who wrote many times about bilingualism and multiculturalism and multilingualism, uh, quite often, rather strangely, in Norwegian journals. He didn't write in Norwegian, you, you, either of the two main language groups of Norway, um, because they publish in English, but Norwegians are particularly interested in bilingualism because of the two main dialect groups of what we would call Norwegian. So they were very interested. But that, if you like, there is a long history to this stuff, and uh, it's, no, it's no harm in reinventing the wheel, but it's not a bad idea to look back at some of the battles um, people like my dad and Josie fought, and, and perhaps foolishly or unwisely thought they had won. Um, but indeed, in the early days of the ILEA and things like that, they thought that some of those battles were won. And the other thing is geographically. I mean, um, many of you know other places in the world. Um, I mean, a place like Singapore, there's plenty not to recommend about Singapore. But one of the extraordinary things that when I've been there twice, I don't know what the situation is now exactly, but they did have a quadrilingual policy. And it was quite extraordinary. Um, and so I visited various places and simultaneous translations were going on in education in a sense that there were four languages that people spoke in Singapore. Let me see if I've got this right. English, Malay, Tamil, and I think Cantonese. And it was understood that for Singapore to thrive, these four languages had to survive as well. That there wasn't some way in which Singapore was going to survive with one language. It needed the four and that was fully understood. I'm not saying we're going to learn lots and lots of things about that, but at the same time, in many countries, the issue of multilingualism is present, which reminds us that we're talking in a very, very British dimension here. When people talk about language and culture, you know, we can only, you know, if we only just remember back, it was around about the time of the Olympics, the way in which people talk about diversity 
and multilingualism in this country is utterly dominated by a sense that English is not only a very good and interesting language, but also is just the world's best. And really, a lot of other people are trying to catch up with us because we speak this incredibly superior language. This is not me saying this, okay? You understand. <laughs> and that this came out. I remember quite dist you know, distinct various occasions in which we've heard that expressed. So that's one problem. And the other one is what I would say is, again, I think you've touched on it, is that when we use the word language and languages, it's a very neutralizing word. Languages have very different statuses in the world not only and simply English, but almost any other language you can name. And of course, there's a conception of language that if you say French or you say German or you say Dutch, you're talking about one static, discrete is the word, phenomenon, not something that has many dialects, prestige and otherwise, and that at any moment people might be able to hop between dialects as well as between languages, and these are all valid in terms of people's understanding, culture, cognition, and the rest. So, you know, we quite often have talked about Bangladeshis arriving in London, and we may talk about Bengali, and we may talk about Sileti. Now, these all are very subtle and very important differences. And, you know, and some of them are bound by religious uh, in, uh, matters and sometimes geographical, sometimes class, which comes into it. And I'm acutely aware of that because a language like Yiddish was much despised, much despised by the leaders of the Jewish community and indeed much despised for a while by the, uh, the country of Israel. So it's a, it was a home language that many people looked down their noses at. So this applies in many parts of the world. So obviously when we talk about language, this is not itself a neutral term. You know, uh, we, some people have said, you know, the difference between the language and the dialect is that uh, a language is a dialect with an army. Um, and that's quite a serious point, and it is that it's the national status is the language, and we have to be very careful about what we're talking about when we talk with children. I've, I've heard, for example, Mira Sile talking about Punjabi and how, you know, she had no idea that, I think I seem to remember her saying that it was the language of her mother and her grandmothers but never really understood it to be something that you would find in books necessarily. And so she became very interested in Punjabi drama of one sort or another. So we have to be quite, quite careful about that. The other thing, it seems to me, is to remind ourselves that one of the problems is that we are in a kind of grammar frenzy. We're living at the moment with a completely false model of how to describe language. So we have what you will know, SPAG test, spelling, punctuation, and grammar test now for key stage one, key stage two, and of course it's got an important role to play in GCSEs. Now, in some ways, we can sort of lay it all to one side and say, well, that's what they're getting on with in English. The problem is, is it lays down in people's minds, particularly people who are not trained in linguistics in any way at all, with a completely false model of what is language. Let's remind ourselves, we invented language, human beings, in order to make meanings for each other as part of our behavior, as part of how we live and work together. That's why human beings invented language. The crucial part of what makes, us, makes it language is that it has grammar. That's before, if you like, we start to describe it. Now, along come various people down through the centuries from the ancient Greeks onwards who propose ways of describing language, and that's the other meaning of the word grammar. The only problem is, is that people describe it more often than not as if grammar is a sealed system. That's to say it doesn't have to refer to language in use, it doesn't have to refer to language making meaning, and it doesn't have to refer to language in behaviour. I'll take one very, very trivial example. Last month I wrote an article in The Guardian saying how pathetic I thought that the SPAG test for Key Stage 2 is, that it was not only full of errors but also it was misconceived. And one of the examples I gave was I used the phrase, which would be familiar to many of you, of the possessive pronoun, okay? Excuse me, anyone who's like bored already and is already falling asleep, because <laughs> you, you just, just doze off quietly, because I fully understand how annoying this stuff can be. Okay, so let's just take the single word my. Everyone in the room uses the word my. You may use it in English, and you will have ways of saying it in your other, other languages. Indeed, often in English, it has been called the possessive pronoun. However, some people don't think it should be called the possessive pronoun. They think it should be called the possessive adjective, and others think it shouldn't be called either. It should be called a determiner. Okay, now another half of you have already fallen asleep. Okay, now, 
there are pages of argument on the comments thread following my article while people think they're taking me to task by using the word possessive pronoun. I don't care a damn at that level what it's called. They somehow thought that I was being pedantic. But let's leave that to one side. So we call a word like my, and people are arguing about whether it is a possessive pronoun or is something. What are they missing? They're missing the crucial thing. Why have we invented the word my? What is the purpose of it? What is, if you like, its functional and behavioral use? What it is is in order to say it belongs, haha, that's there in the possessive, but also that it refers, it refers to whoever is me, and that me may be in the text prior to the my, or it may be outside of the text. In other words, I say, would you like to borrow my hat? Would you like to borrow my shoes? No is the answer, but I know, but yeah. <laughs> it's referring. There is nowhere in the description of the word my in these grammars that we hand to children that suggests that this my is a meaning beyond it belongs, which is okay, but it's only ha half of the story at the most. It is a behavioral act when we say, do you want my shoes? It refers, it's a referring word and is part of how we stick language together. Now, this seemingly trivial little point I'm making is incredibly important because it applies right the way across how we conceive language <coughs> as part of behaviour and use and not as some silly game to play where we invent terms and then argue with each other, spitting blood at each other over whether it's an effing determiner or whether it's a possessive pronoun or a possessive adjective. These are trivial arguments. Now, it seems to me that this notion of language and what our language is, you see, it feeds over into the way in which we trivialise the importance of language as part of behaviour. We don't have that as a way of talking to each other in shorthand. Instead, when the moment we start talking about language, we have the sleep-inducing grammar crap, right? Which, in actual fact, is ultimately not connected. It's only when you sit down, say, with school students and connect it with how we say things, and this brings me on to the issue of multilingualism, there is no better way than to talk about function, use, and meaning than when you are sitting with bilingual and multilingual children and students because they're doing it all the time. They're using it for their behaviours all the time. This is how I talk to my, as I would say, my Bubba and Zayda, my grandparents. This is how I talk to my mother. This is how I talk to my mates at school. And they're operating. You talked about code switching. They're doing it more than I would do. They're doing it, you know, in many different ways, many London children. But that, when you consider that, then you reconnect with the purpose and function of language. So this seems to me, a, you know, a battle to be fought and a battle to be won. And if, as I sometimes see, that when people talk about multilingualism, it gets reduced to what I call the sealed system approach to language, we do it in injustice. We have to constantly reconnect. I mean, the linguists who call it sociolinguistics. I'm calling it, as it's all some people call it, systemic functionalism and various other things. But the crucial thing is we use language to make meaning as part of our behaviour, as part of the way we are in society. So, you know, you've talked and I heard uh, today, you know, many of the different ways you've used, uh, people have used multilingualism as an asset and a resource. And I think that's our baseline. It isn't a disadvantage. You may remember that in the kind of uh, blood spitting speech of Cameron somewhere round about the Olympics where there was the whole attack on what he called a state sponsored multiculturalism. Um, which, incidentally, rather bizarrely, there is no party that's done more state-sponsored multiculturalism than they have, because they hand out DOSH to faith schools that are, in fact... I just, anyway, never mind. Why, why, why worry about contradiction? Um, and um, he, one, one of his outbursts was about um, ho people speaking their own home language in their homes and how what a terrible you know, drawback this was. A couple of rather high-up Asian folks uh, reminded him that they had come from homes where their first language had been Punjabi or Gujarati, and he seemed totally unmoved by that, of course. Why, why, why listen to that? Um, um, so our bottom line is that we have to think of all language as an asset and resource because it is helping us with our behaviour and our making of meaning. You can't have something that is helping you with that that is a drawback. So this fundamental truth does not seem to have reached 
the upper echelons. They think that what you do is you acquire a foreign language, stick it on, and this will enable you to be a merchant. So it's a sort of <laughs> Greek version, ancient Greek version of what the sort of function of language teaching is in schools. You just you learn French because that will enable you to talk to French people because French people can't learn English, or whatever it is, but the, the, the notion that that's why you do it and, and the whole ideology around it is totally separate from the idea that this is the way we can be and the way it is useful and, of course, leaves out the other crucial thing that if you inhabit several languages, you inhabit several positions in relation to life. That if you stand in the room where you might be for that matter, speaking Latin or Greek or Anglo-Saxon or French or Punjabi, you have another way to look at the world that you inhabit and that anything that enables you to have 360 or greater degree of thinking about the world we live in, we should regard as a massive asset and resource, particularly when so much of our political way of speaking is to narrow us down and to talk about the world in what might be called... Um, binary ways in which we're good and the rest of the world is bad, apart from those who join us, which you know, is the point at which we're living now, and it's quite worrying. That what, it, what is in part engendered by that is a notion that language, our language, is more important than anyone else's. Um, within schools and our daily practice, as I say, you, you've been giving some wonderful examples. Perhaps I could just tell you some others. Uh, I've already heard about Translation Nation, which I was to a certain extent an outsider to, but it, when, I, when I was involved in that just um, marginally in that radio program, I was reminded of a project that we did at John Skur Primary School many years ago uh, where we collected stories from the children, um, asking them to record them in their own languages and then to sit in pairs translating them and so on. And then along came a project. It was just happening in Paris, a big storytelling festival, and they were putting out these messages that would schools come and take part in it. And I suggested to the school that wouldn't it be great to take some of the stories that the children had been telling, dramatise them, and take them over there. And the children could tell them, in, in this case it was largely Siletti, um, and then to act them out, probably in English, so that you know, it could be shared with a, with a translator and so on for the others. Um, and uh, we did that. We translated uh, several stories that the children told and put them on. And it was a wonderful way to celebrate so many aspects. It celebrated not simply the fact they could speak a non-English language, but it celebrated their bilingualism. And one of the stories was quite extraordinary. Uh, I put it, in fact, into the Oxfam book of stories, East and West, South and North. Do look out for that. I mean, if it was published by Walkers. I mean, in an ideal world, the stories would have been published bilingually, but that wasn't to be. But it was basically, that, that book was based on a whole set of stories that I collected across London schools. Another thing, I don't know whether you spoke about this earlier, doing language maps with children and students. I found this incredible, where you just draw a circle and you put me in the middle and then you draw lines off. Yes, it's you know, one of the great spider-gram things. And you draw lines off and the lines reach to any situation, any person in your life that you can record where some significant or some act of language making went on in any language. And in fact, you can find a project that I think died, as sometimes these things sadly do, uh, from that Hackney, uh, what was originally the... Uh, Teacher Centre, the uh, Professional Development Centre, based on language maps. I don't know whether any of you were involved in that, but it's a, it was a wonderful thing across Hackney schools of school students, I think they were mostly year eights and nines, recording the many situations. And I quite often do it as part of teacher training. I don't know if some of you do, but teacher workshops. Because everybody has this experience. You know, nobody talks identically in exactly the same way as their grandparents or if they knew their great-grandparents or their aunties and uncles. And we travel through many language situations. You know, part of the kind of obscurity of what the way in which people talk about language is they smudge it over the difference between our spoken language and our written language. You know, all of us will speak non-prestige forms of the language, and written language is by and large prestige, except when we're writing poetry and dialogue, dialogue and occasionally some other forms. But in actual fact, continuous prose is not the way we speak. Just try it. It's rather extraordinary if you just try and have a conversation reading stuff out of a book. It just doesn't hang together because we, you know, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so uh, to do this kind of work on language maps is a wonderful act of self-revelation that applies to everybody, even to so-called native speakers, that you discover these, these language areas that you possess and you can put down songs that you heard or proverbs or... 
uh, phrases or that moment when you first heard such and such a word that you didn't understand, and you can build it up as a complex language picture which tallies with you know, what the linguistic theorists call repertoire. We all have a repertoire, an intertextual repertoire, that spreads across the whole of our lives. I mean, the, wo the way we were spoken to when we were four is different from the way we're spoken to when we're 20, we hope. Um, and, you know, you can get children, students, whatever, to record this. They can remember what their mums and dads called them when they were little kids and what they call them now. Yeah, so, you know, the progression from... No, I won't go there. Um, <laughs> people have said it's very hard for schools to... Um, to celebrate the diversity, let me tell you about Redbridge Primary, which we went to as part of word of mouth. They have an internal TV system in the school. It's a huge primary school. They have a language of the week. The language of the week belongs to, to one of the school, one of the pupils at the school, and the pupil comes onto the telly and talks to the rest of the school on the internal telly system and has a, does a little speech in his or her language, something about, hello, my name is... Uh, Abdul, and in, in his language, if it was Abdul, in whatever is his language, and he says, hello, my name is Abdul, I'm talking to you in such and such a language, and then he translates it and says, I've just said to you, da, da, da. and then every class has a little look at one or two, let's say if it was Arabic in this particular case, looks at some Arabic words, learns how to say goodbye and hello and various other little things and how are you. You know, to a certain extent tokenistic, on the other hand, it's an acknowledgement that this is something that the school community owns. It owns this huge diversity of languages, and it's called the language of the week. And there were various other aspects and behaviours that they did in connection with it, but it just seemed to me, even as a sort of tokenistic thing, there was something about the school acknowledging that this was something that the, the children themselves so the children themselves actually actually owned. Um, and another area that is, strikes me is that quite undeveloped in a strange sort of way. I, when I go into schools, I quite often, if I'm in a class or even in a big assembly, I'll talk about the fact that my parents spoke Yiddish and French in particular, and I'll do some little bits and do a little French poem or something like that and tell them uh, a the little French, a little Yiddish, half Yiddish poem that my dad used to say when I was a kid, Harold Schmerl went to the races, lost his gutkas and his braces. And uh, Harold Schmerl means little fool, and lost his gutkas meant he lost his trousers, but at least that's what I thought it was, but then whenever I talk to people who speak Yiddish, they say, no, it's his long johns, which is very exciting. Suddenly we got a whole idea of Harold, a little fool, he went to the races and lost his long johns, his big long underpants, uproar by now, um, <laughs> lost his underpants, and I used to think it was because he ran so fast, and only later did I find it was because he even bet his underpants in the horse race. So it's very dodgy. So, um, so, um, you know, if I talk about that, and then quite often I go back to the staff room afterwards, and I can't tell you the number of times there's this sort of pause, the teachers say, well, that was funny when you said that, and that story about the schmutter, and one or two other little stories, and then almost immediately what happens, certainly in London schools, is that people start telling me stories, the teachers this is, about their bilingualism, trilingualism, and the funny joke, or the lullaby, or the story, and then when I go into classrooms, if that's slightly different from the big hall, and we just sit talking, and if you like, what is an underdeveloped resource is the multilingualism of teachers, because teachers themselves feel under pressure not to reveal their bi-dialectalisms and multilingualisms. You know, anybody, any teacher, say, of Irish origin is almost certainly not speaking in the same way to the class as they spoke, say, with their grandparents or whatever, in Ireland, you know, uh, same might apply to Scots teachers or Welsh, and that there is this huge, or different parts of Britain indeed, and the moment teachers lift the lid and reveal these accents and dialects, there's like joy in the room. I mean, just to take, you know, it's a, obviously a source of immense comedy that we see on the telly. I mean, there's, what's his name, Peter Kay, the comedian. You know, we always think, you know, he's, he's solid Lancashire, and we kind of listen to him putting out these things in Lancashire, and then every now and then he does his mum. And his mum comes from Northern Ireland, and he can imitate his mother perfectly. So one moment, you got the Lancashire accent, and then suddenly, Bedoying comes in this kind of big Belfast thing into the middle of it. And, of course, people laugh, because we acknowledge and admire the bi-dialectalism of him. Well, that applies to hundreds and hundreds of teachers. All of you in the room probably could do your mum or dad, would end up being a different voice from your own voice. So I would say that. But then the other key area 
that we can develop this multilingualism is if ever we talk about migration. It's the elephant in the room, isn't it? We all migrate, even if all we ever do is move next door. <laughs> you know, bar the, the most disabled amongst us, okay, we all move what my mother would say, we move our tuchus, that's your bum. We all move our tuchus from one place to another. It is part of the human condition. We are movers. You know, we can see it in the origins of humanity, indeed, that there are migrators. Everything we know about human beings is we migrate. This country would be uninhabited if people hadn't migrated. The ice cap used to cover it. So the whole point is we are migrators. Now, that history is very rarely told within schools. So, you know, you look at the timeline that's gone up in primary schools, Stone Age to 1066, you know, you would think... All right, it does describe people's arriving in one form or another, but normally it's in a kind of false picture of how the you know, the sequence that happened one after the other. You know, the Stone Age came to an end. What happened with blokes walking around going, we're living in the Stone Age? Oh, no, it's just ended. <laughs> but you see it on the timeline. There's a line. It says Stone Age, chunk, Iron Age. So what happened was, hey, look, I've got a bit of iron here. That's amazing. Oh, it's the end of the Stone Age. Yeah, thank God we got over that bit. You know, and then... The Celts came, and then they stopped coming, and then the Romans came, and then they all buggered off. They all disappeared. There were no Romans. They all went. And then, what do you know, the Anglo-Saxons turned up. They went, yeah, we like this. And then Bedoying, the Vikings turned up, then the Normans turned up, and that's the end, really. There, was, there wasn't much more happened after that. Um, and, you know, you, you'd be quite legitimate to come out of primary school thinking that. Yeah, no matter how nicely or beautifully that teachers had taught it, if you came out of primary school thinking that, you'd have done okay, even though it is complete and utter dreck, as my mother would say. That means <laughs> crap. Okay. So it seems to me, in secondary school, you know, I watch my daughter, who's now nearly 15, and the various parts in which she's done history, and there's some interesting stuff in geography, perhaps, but history is told as if migration is not part of history. And it seems to me extraordinary. And the moment you tell stories of migration, you tell stories of language. The moment you do it. I, was, you know, I have traced various parts of my family uh, tree and all the rest of it. I cannot do it without taking on board, and I've not had to make a list of it here, Yiddish, German, Polish, French, and English. It is not possible for me to tell that story without investigating. And in fact, one whole crucial part of the migration of my family, I could only uncover because I can speak French. It would be totally, you know, I would have to take great piles of books with documents about what happened to Jews in France during the war. I would have to take it to people and ask them to translate it, whereas, you know, I want to sit there and comb the internet and so on. So the moment if we put migration into the story of education, we would also be putting language, and we would be putting language on the agenda as language in use. I'll give you one tiny example. I was told through my childhood that there was somebody called Oscar Rosen. Oscar Rosen in the family who was in France at the beginning of the war and he wasn't there at the end of the war. And all this time I heard about Oscar Rosen. Oscar Rosen was one of my father's uncles. And I went to America and I asked my relatives and said, what happened to Oscar Rosen? They said, they don't know. We don't know. He lived in France at the beginning of the war. He wasn't there at the end of the war. That was how it existed in the family. Okay. And then many years later, some letters turned up. These letters were written in German. These letters weren't written in Yiddish, but one of the letters said, you can write to us in Yiddish if you want to. So it was clearly some bilingualism. One of them was from Oscar Rosen, 1940, address in France. So I did a whole load more researching and stuff in French and discovered the first wall I hit was that the address that I came across in which a Rosen was staying, the address that was in the letter, wasn't occupied by an Oscar Rosen, but by a Yeshi Rosen. So I had Oscar and I had Yeshi. Was this the same person or a brother or whatever? So there immediately, just in the key issue of naming, is a whole history around German Hebrew and Yiddish naming. Yes, as it happens, he carried both names. And those of you who know anything about Jewish naming, it's not a mystery, but I won't, I won't go into it. But the point is, many of us, that if the moment we look at migration, there will be questions of naming, questions of kinship names. Does uncle mean uncle? Is he really an uncle? Or is he just the person who was called uncle? Or is that, and also there are two words for uncle in some sides of the family. Some people, some, some cultures have a, a as it were, female side uncle, male side uncle, and so on. 
And so it seems to me that in many ways to explore migration is a political necessity, it's an educational necessity, and it's also a linguistic one. I will stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>